and the air was suddenly rent with screams as men danced in agony, clawing and staggering, their hair standing on end. Welcome back, folks, to another Ed Time story. Today, we are going to be talking about uh, Illustrial Silver Hand, which is actually a companion piece to another video that we did somewhere on the screen here. I will leave that for you to check out. Um, but Ed, you want to tell them a little bit about what the story is going on? Sure. So the other bit is lore about Illustrial. This is a story, a moment you are there for a moment when Illustrial brings herself and the aid of Mr. her goddess to just an ordinary mortal who's thrust into a crisis. All right, so if you're enjoying these videos, please be sure to like, subscribe, uh, go ahead and turn on notifications so you can be let known, uh, you know, the next time we release these videos. And also please consider becoming a protector of the realms. If you go to patreon.com slash edgreenwood, uh, you can get works in progress, tons of more exclusive realms lore and all sorts of cool stuff. And the support from the Patreon is actually what allows us to continue making these videos here. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. And please enjoy How the Bridge Was Held. How the bridge was held. She could hear them coming, many. By all the footfalls, the creak of harness, the jangle of scabbard ring and chain, this fight would be her last. Falktress mourned she, murmured a farewell to her latest lord of love, and bade the six gods she held most dear make her passing as painless as they could. Timora, Helm, Shanti Mother, Tear the just, my leaky and mistra. Then she strode to the foremost end of the bridge, planted self in the center of its road, and drew the long blade and the short, grounding the first and leaning on it, to await the bringers of her death. They did not keep her waiting. Around the last leafy bend of the forest road they strode, swords flashing out in untidy chorus, as they beheld the lone armored figure in their way. Men in motley armor, but who wore the same crimson surcoats with golden spearheads large down left breast. They looked this way and that for any signs of ambush, archers in hiding, traps on the road they trod, and saw nothing, yet faltered as they came to the bridge and finally halted uneasily in the face of that lone man's calm. But no, t'was a woman in those war leathers. Her face grim but without fear, her eyes as alert as those of a hunting hawk. The bridge had low stone walls, framing a way just large enough for two narrow old wagons to pass, wheel boss to wheel boss, with exacting care. If they'd been mounted, they could have readily have ridden her down, and if they'd had lances, spitted her on three or more like a flatfish speared in the shallows. But though they outnumbered her more than a score to one, and could mayhap rush past in a great charge, her swords would find someone, and no one much wanted to be that someone. Forward! snapped their commander, Warlord Vrance of the Golden Spears. She's but the one! Halthor, your amulet! This last command was to the senior sword captain who wore an amulet of spell reflection to hold it to the fore, lest this lone woman be not a madwitz, or not just a madwitz, but a font of deadly spells. Halthor fetched forth his precious disc and strode stolidly forward, flanked by two men on either side, all of them with steel drawn. Cell swords, the woman called. Why come you here to Rantz? Who's hired you? And to do what? The advancing line of men made no reply until just before their strides would bring them into collision with her, which was when Vrance called back, Stand aside, woman, if you would live. Turn back, she replied almost wearily, if you would. And she let go of her grounded sword, which stood upright on its point, without wavering or falling, to reach to the back of her neck, under her hair, to pluck and throw. A steel fang whirled through the air, a dagger hurled sure and swift. Warlord Vrance struck it aside with his own sword, almost contemptuously, which meant the second blade, flashing silver in the wake of the first, took him in the throat, slicing well up under his ear, and he gurgled, staggered, 
clutched vainly at his throat and fell. By then, Halthor and his line were upon the woman, stepping wide to encircle her and make certain of their kill. They wanted this swift and sure so they could look again for an ambush or have time to spot and run down a sentinel watching them afar so that no warning could reach a rance ahead of them. She moved sideways as swiftly as any young tavern dancer, her sword flashing up by itself to race pommel first to her reaching hand as she outraced the end of the line and ducked low under that man's vicious slash to hamstring him, stabbing up through the stout breeches where the back of his heavy boots ended. He roared out pain in her wake as she raced on, back behind the man beside him to slice his throat from behind, not slowing a whit as she came to Halthor, turning to meet her, but slowed just a trice by having the amulet held up on its chain in his dagger hand, and the throat slit man in the way of the point of his sword as he sought to sweep it up and parry. A gorget protected his throat, but did nothing at all to protect the back of his neck. So he trembled and staggered on numb legs as the woman's dagger sank guards deep in his spine. The last movements his legs would ever make on his command. By then, the last two men had turned with angry snarls to face the racing slayer, their swords up but their eyes on the sword that had flown into her hands and now flashed as she hefted it, almost as if it was eager to draw blood. The rest of the watching Golden Spears were cursing, their attention divided between their commander crashing down on his face among them to bleed copiously in dying silence and the deaths of Halthor and his flanking blades before them. But the old veteran Meherak spat and then roared, At her! Spears! Charge! And they did. Surging forward in a cacophony of yells, bloodlust up and swords out to hack down this lone obstacle and then sweep down on a rance where there'd be plunder and blundering unarmed fools to slaughter and there was suddenly a silver singing sheen in the air, a chill wail of warring eerie blue and silver light clawing at the edges of their vision that stretched across the mouth of the bridge. At its center stood a lone woman in an ankle length gown, her face beautiful but angry, her eyes flashing silver, as silver as the long tresses of her hair that stretched out 40 feet or more to trace that wall, writhing like the tentacles of some great monster of the deep. Below the gown, her feet were fine-booted and trod empty air, the height of a tall warm helm off the ground. Back, warriors, if you would live, she commanded, her voice quiet, yet in their ears as clearly as if she stood beside them and calmly imperious. Behind her, the warrior woman made a small sound of pain and leaned again upon her sword, blood running from her fingers from a fresh wound. Amid the bodies of the last two golden spears who'd advanced with Halthor, who was still moving his arms feebly, face down and groaning, but fighting and failing to lift his head. The charging mercenaries came to an untidy, stumbling halt. Swords up, anger on many faces. Blood! One of them snarled out his hunger. Who are you? Another shouted at the floating woman with the impossible, still restlessly snaking silver hair. Your doom if you turn not back, came the calm reply. If a name will make you happier, I am Illustrial Silverhand. Never heard of you! One golden spear spat. I have, an older sword brother said grimly, then called, One of the seven? One of the seven, Illustrial affirmed. Back, the veteran mercenary called to his fellows. We turn back. You don't give orders here, Brarius, Meherek snarled. Charge her! And he flung his belt hand axe at her. End over end it flew, swift and sure, dropping at the end of its flight to slice, not the floating woman's face, but her breast just beneath her collarbone. They all saw her wince as it clove flesh and waver in the air from the force of the blow. Silver fire, not blood, burst forth from the wound as it bit deep into her and stayed, and she hissed out wordless pain. As if 
Meherak's flinging had been a signal, the air was suddenly full of golden spear, daggers and swords, and very few of them missed. The floating woman now bristled with blades and was wreathed in silver fire, boiling up and away like smoke while more of it dripped to hiss and puddle beneath her. She looked down, face tight with pain, and observed, Time for a new gown, I see. Ear lifting her head to glare at the mercenaries and add, I did warn you. Taste some blood lightning, men of the golden spear, and learn some prudence. And the air was suddenly rent with screams as men danced in agony, clawing and staggering, their hair standing on end. Lightning snarled and danced along all the metal they wore or bore, arcing from sword points to armor and finger rings as they fled and howled. And when it died away, more than half the golden spears had fled, and those that remained were on their knees or hugging themselves in pain on the ground, weapons and armor flung away. Get you gone and stay gone from Arance, or you will taste worse. Alestriel warned, plucking sword hilts from her body and tossing them to the ground. The blades that had been attached to them were melted away. Away, men of the golden spear, she commanded as softly as ever, but this time even Meherik scrambled to obey. And when they were all gone but the sprawled dead, Alustriel sank down until her feet touched the ground and strode to where Falk Tresmorn Tree leaned on her sword, in pain, but staring at her silver-haired savior in awe. Alustriel reached out with two fingers and touched the swordswoman's wound, and Silverfire flared up like dry kindling taking flame. Falk Trest hissed in pain and shrank back but then stared at Illustrial and down at herself in astonishment, for wound and its pain alike were gone as if they had never been. Farewell, Falkress Morntree, Illustrial said with a sisterly smile. You fought well this day and saved a rat. I, I, whence came you? You called on Mistra in your time of need. Illustrial took two steps away, and it was as if she was climbing an invisible stair and stepping into mists as she grew faint and translucent and once more aloft. She turned back and added with a smile as her silver hair swirled around the rent ruin of her gown. Sometimes the gods listen. Hi, welcome back to Realm Speak. This time around we're tackling this. And this is the name of a rather deadly and strange critter. It could be Catoblecus, because I have heard that. But sages will tell you, and the critters themselves will tell you, if they were talking to you without trying to kill you first, um, their name is pronounced Catoblepa. Four syllables. Second syllable is the emphasis. Catoblepa. Cat. Oh, oh, cat oval So that there cat oval paw over there, we should be aware of it. It's not as bad as a gazebo, but it's close. 